So Rain by Edward Thomas is an absolutely stunning poem. I remember just reading it the first time and being really shocked by how beautiful it is, but also how kind of stark and uh, kind of intense. There's a lot of sort of heaviness, I think, to this poem, but also a lot of clarity. So um, the first thing I think you should really do before we jump into the lesson is if you've not read this poem yet, just read it aloud to yourself now and try and get your own personal response to it before we start. It's not too hard to understand, so it's the kind of poem that you should be able to just read and be able to get a little bit of an overview. Even if you don't understand everything, you'll get a sense of what's happening here. Um, so yeah, just try and enjoy kind of how beautiful it is, really. The language, the structure, everything is really, you know, masterful in this poem. And uh, it's not a happy poem, so <laughs> yeah, if you like more happy poems, sorry, this one is not probably one for you but um yeah I like poetry personally to show huge range of emotions and kind of the whole realm of human experience so I, I like happy poems as much as sad poems and funny poems as much as tragic poems so yeah if you try and think of poetry like that like it's not like all poetry should be depressing but some depressing poetry can be good and this is an example of a good depressing poem and uh yeah, hopefully, hopefully you feel similar about it to, to me at the end. So here is the poem. If you want to pause and read aloud, you might just underline images or words that stand out to you as you read as well. So the way that poetry works is that writers always try and emphasize certain images through the sounds or the structure of the poem. So when you read a poem aloud, you really notice the bits that the poet wants you to notice. Um, so as you do that, you can just kind of circle or jot down what you think are the, the really standout words or phrases. Yeah, good. So hopefully you've read that aloud. I actually, because I really love this poem um, and it's out of copyright, so I can actually publish it. I'll probably put a recording of me doing it on the Scribbly page. Uh, so if you're studying this as part of the Cambridge collection, there'll be a recording of this poem that you can listen to of me speaking it in case you're not sure exactly how to speak it or you know what to, uh, what kind of rhythm to use or that kind of thing I'll give you my interpretation of it there so you can check scribbly.com for a reading of the poem as well if you if you're not confident reading aloud so there's a little bit of vocabulary here not too much um he, he tries to use quite simplistic language that is sort of everyday speech really so the, there's a lot of words that should just be kind of obvious to you occasionally there's odd words like myriads which means a lot um, solitude which means kind of loneliness or isolation so yeah occasionally the odd word that is a bit unusual but generally you know reasonably easy to understand there's a nice little summary of it here and um it's just kind of giving you the feeling of the poem and the general sort of uh, sort of thought pattern or structure of the poem without any of the you know the poeticness of it so that it's kind of clearer to understand so uh, yeah feel free to read this through in your own time if you feel like you need a bit more of a breakdown of what's happening I'll just give you a really quick overview of it now as well so basically there's these people they're stood in a shelter and there's just rain and, um, you know, wild rain all around. And there's a man who's actually, sorry, there's not loads of people. There's just one man and he's standing, it's raining and he's thinking of lots of people throughout his life at this point. So there's a sense of solitude, isolation, being kind of, in a small shelter but surrounded by a storm essentially and he's thinking about death but he's also thinking about purity and sort of spiritual purity the idea that water can cleanse or heal or kind of um, spiritually purify someone so there's a feeling like something about this rain even though it's wild and it's intense and he's alone it's not necessarily bad it's sort of comforting and he says, um, I think he says, blessed are the dead that the rain rains upon, which I really love. It's like a beautiful line, kind of dark, but beautiful. And the idea is that um, 
you know, anyone who's in the ground, <laughs> who's died, that, that are kind of being rained on, there's something holy about them that, you know, that dead people are not necessarily gone. They might be in heaven or they might be blessed. So there's a sense of continuation after physical death. And he hopes that nobody is alone or dying right now, though. So even though he thinks the dead are blessed, he hopes that no one he knows is dead or dying or even alone, like how he's feeling alone. Um, he feels kind of sad and a bit sort of uh, isolated, I think, cut off from anything that he loves in his life. And there's a feeling that he might be longing a bit for death, that there's something kind of peaceful and holy about death that might appeal to the speaker as well. So it's quite a kind of mixed tone. It, it is very dark in some ways, with this idea of, um, you know, he hopes that there's no one like him, like me, who has no love, which this wild rain has not dissolved except the love of death if love it be towards what is perfect and cannot, the tempest tells me disappoint. A little bit difficult to interpret those lines. The way that I see it is that he hopes that other people aren't feeling like him. He's kind of feeling a little bit inclined towards the idea of death being peaceful or death being potentially good um, because it's a, a state of perfection and the state of being human is imperfect. Like we have a lot of, you know, of suffering and difficulty as humans while we're alive that dissolves or disappears in death. So he feels like death is the only thing in life that would not disappoint him, which sounds very dramatic and sad, but also I think in some ways like interesting if you view it from a spiritual perspective. So it really depends on your own personal uh, beliefs if you believe in afterlife or a God or, or not, because um, your attitude to death would be very different if you were atheistic, for example. So yeah, beautiful, complex, sort of psychological, emotional poem. Um, lots and lots of techniques. So we're going to jump into those in a second. There's also an analysis of the speaker if you're kind of trying to get more of a handle on who is this guy, because it's a very abstract poem as well. We don't actually know any physical details or personal details about the speaker. We just know that they're standing in a shelter alone. There's rain. That's it. So it's a very um, kind of murky landscape that he paints here. It's it's almost like a psychological landscape rather than a real one, like a dream or something like that. So it's a bleak hut, but we don't know space, time, situation, location, anything about the person themselves. The most important thing, I think, to help you understand this poem is it's written um, during World War I, as Thomas was undergoing military training. So he's not actually gone to war yet, but he's surrounded by fellow soldiers who are all preparing for war, and the war is kind of all around him. And that might help you understand this strange idea that death might be better than life because life is suffering. Because, um, you know, if you're in the middle of a war, everyone around you is suffering. You don't know if you're going to win or not. Um, you're trying to deal with the, the psychological impact of war. You could see that death almost at that point is is a blessing because at least it's finite and it's over so you can kind of think about that you can also read it a bit more generally not as a war poem but just generally about life death and spirituality peace and suffering chaos those types of ideas as well are kind of embedded within the poem so it doesn't just stick to its world war one context it can be applied more generally as well so yeah, there's um, a lot of interesting language features here. Uh, my favorite line, like I said, is blessed are the dead that the rain rains upon. And it's because of the alliteration of the um, R and the Ds there that are just really, really beautiful, I think, kind of like circular and recursive, like they sort of circle around almost like the, there's a storm swirling around the hut that the speaker is in. And then there's um, you know, his thoughts swirling around his head about life and death and rain and loneliness and companionship and, and that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, you'll notice the word rain, you might want to circle the number of times that this word turns up, but 
a lot. <laughs> like there's a lot of references to rain. Uh, so it's sort of constant, almost like every time that word drops into the poem, there's kind of like another raindrop in, in the scene. Um, yeah, death and solitude also heavily repeated words, almost like they're kind of drumming into the speaker's mind. Um, there's a sense of estrangement here in isolation, which is consistent again with the experience of soldiers in trenches uh, in World War One, or soldiers um, even in training, like, you, you know, you'd have moments where you're sort of working together in a team, other moments where you're, you're completing the training alone. So this section of his training, he's, um, you know, he feels lonely. Yeah, so lots of interesting visual images. You might want to go circle the images as well through the poem because the, it helps you to sort of picture the scene, even though the scene, like I say, is quite abstract there. Yeah, there's this really interesting line, myriads of broken reeds, which for me, because I teach Keats a lot, it reminded me of Beldam Saint Messi, Keats' poem, um, where it says, the sedge has withered from the lake and no birds sing. So that is a, a line about the reeds um, withering from the edge of a lake. They're kind of dying back and birds aren't singing. And it's a suggestion that there's no kind of love or warmth in the night's world. So the night is kind of like a, you know, he's also like a soldier who's alone and he's kind of had this like broken experience with a lover. So it's got a really similar kind of tone. Um, so if you have time, I'd really recommend reading Keats's poem. I have like some videos on YouTube you can watch on that as well, because I got really into it. So I think I made two different videos on it if you want to understand that poem as well. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's a sort of connection, I think, psychologically between Beldam Saint Messi and then this poem here because the, the imagery is also symbolic and it's kind of a very similar sort of like lonely, sad tone to it. Um, so yeah, well, there's a lot more techniques, like I say, because there's tons in here, but I'll skip forwards, I think now to structure. So it's a meditation on death, which is a, a meditation is a type of poem that we call lyric. So it's a lyric poem expressing an idea rather than a narrative poem, which would tell a story. There's no actual story here. It's just a concept. Um, so it's a meditation, which is where you sit and think about something and reflect on it. And yeah, it's a single stanza that is a fragment and um, it creates like, you know, a sense of fragmentedness of the mind or the speaker's thought patterns as well. It's quite a modernist, so modernist poets um, that are writing around kind of 1900 to 1930, they try and capture psychological processes in what we call a stream of consciousness style. So stream of consciousness is this way that really imitates the way that your brain actually works, where you just have random thoughts sort of coming and going, and you might not have a complete, fully finished thought. It's usually like a fragment. So there's this kind of fragmentedness um, to the form, which is really important to write about if you're going to write an essay on this one, because that uh, really kind of um, evokes that sense of like the speaker not being 100% sure of his thoughts and also the speaker just kind of meditating or musing while the rain is raining around. We can also call it a dramatic monologue. So that's a speech from a character who's just kind of talking about a single concept or idea. Um, so yeah, there's a lot more structure and form stuff here. You can go to the scribbly.com page if you want to download this and look through it in detail. Um, but yeah, you can kind of analyze the structure into a really deep level. There's also this thing here about stream of consciousness. If you were kind of more interested in psychology or uh, the way that modernist poets work. So one thing that's quite important is that, um, this poem wasn't actually published until after his death. It was written during military training and, um, it has, uh, it, I, I actually kind of, uh, I don't remember what I did. Did I go to a lecture? I went to a lecture, I think, on Edward Thomas, or I did a course that was part, you know, I partly had to study him at one point. I can't remember exactly how I found this out, but um, 
yeah, generally Edward Thomas is such an interesting poet because he's writing around the time of the First World War, but he's not considered one of the World War poets. So if you, you know, if you think of First World War poets traditionally, you think of like Wilfred Owen, Siegfried Sassoon, these guys, um, you know, directly comment on the experiences of war. What's really interesting about Thomas is that nowadays people consider him to be a war poet, but at the time, no one actually did because he doesn't actually directly talk about soldiers and war and you know there's no mention of his military training in this poem even though it's written during that time in his life so he more talks about the mood and the feeling of how people are at that time or um, the kind of thought processes behind that kind of like life that that people are plunged into so when you read him, it's all about the psychology and the emotion of war, not the physical, actual act of war, which is really interesting, I think. So I like that he's now considered uh, a war poet, but in a very abstract way, not in a physical way, where you actually, when you read his poetry, you actually get the impression of war. It's all just kind of hidden and subconscious. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very, uh, very beautiful, I think, very interesting. I found a collection of Edward Thomas books, uh, sorry, poems in, um, in a bookshop a few weeks ago and I read through them and I, just in the bookshop, I should have really bought them, but I didn't, I didn't really have time. So I kind of just quickly read through and I'd not read loads of his poems before and I only knew a few of them. Uh, yeah, and they're amazing, some of them, they're really beautiful. So if you like this poem, I really recommend reading a lot more of his poetry. Um, so yeah, there's a little bit here about world war and the fact that it's the atmosphere that he's um, capturing, not the imagery of war. So there's another poem uh, that is a standard portrayal of World War One called The Soldier by Rupert Brooke. And if you have time, which I really recommend doing the tasks that I set because they just really help you a lot with understanding the poem in more detail. But here uh, there's a task to read the Soldier by Rupert Brooke, and then do a little bit of a comparison and contrast. You don't have to write a full essay or anything like that. You can just kind of jot down some notes about the similarity and difference between um, Rupert Brooke's The Soldier and Thomas's reign, because they're, they're very different, but they're, they're written in a similar time and they're both responses to the same historical period. So it's quite interesting to contrast them. So there's a lot of attitudes and beliefs here as well. Um, I've gone through the main ones, so feel free to kind of look more in depth at this in your own time. And again, just download it from the scribbly.com page if you, uh, if you want a physical copy of this document. So yeah, the main one I think I'll just go through now is this idea of pathos. Pathos is sympathy and it's um, a feeling that is evoked by tragic writing, traditionally by uh, tragedy, which is a dramatic kind of writing like plays um, but nowadays novels and poems also pick up on that kind of tragic mood uh, so yeah this is a very much tragic poem and therefore um, it's intended to create a lot of pathos which means sympathy for the speaker we're meant to feel sorry for him sorry for his suffering and also kind of I think there's something beautiful in the fact that even though he's really struggling he just hopes that no one he loves is either dead or dying or suffering at this moment. So even though he's having a hard time, he still it's still not all about him, the poem. He's still thinking about other people and then hoping that other people don't feel as bad as he does because he's really, you know, having a bit of a difficult time of it. Um, so it might be people who are off in war already or people who are suffering directly from war. Or it might just be a general comment on, um, you know, the human condition and the state of suffering in the world in general. So there's some themes here. You can make mind maps on these themes and find little quotes from the poem and then analyze those quotes. This type of exercise is always really good if you're trying to do some essay preparation. Um, so yeah, I'd recommend picking one or two themes and sort of exploring them in detail if you have time as well. And then finally, if my page skips, does it skip? Ah, there we go. <laughs> um, yeah, finally, there's some essay questions. And, oh, sorry, that should say exercises. 
So the top one is exercises, the bottom one is essay questions. Um, the top one is things that you should do to explore the poem on a deeper level. And the essay questions is things that uh, you should use to kind of practice essay writing. So you can turn them into essay plans. You can write a full essay for one or two of them as well. So yeah, hopefully you really like this poem. It's not a nice poem, like in terms of it being happy. I think it's a beautiful, interesting, complex poem that's very good at capturing, you know, true essences of humanity and um, reflecting certain states of mind that humans can be in. So it's a very beautiful, I think, poem, very well accomplished. Uh, so yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed learning about it. And um, yeah, do read some of Thomas's other stuff. It's not all this sad. So <laughs> quite a lot of it's the sad, but there are some nice ones as well, happy ones. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for listening and I'll see you guys in a future lesson soon.